And this is our boat. Oh, great. What do you got in here? Nothing. I mean, no, what, what, in terms of engines, what do you got? Oh, oh I got 692 <laughs> Detroits. Okay. I could show one to you. Let's see. What a day. It's hot. Oh, it's a great setup. Yeah. We traveled to Florida to meet Jim and Patty Zubrick. They make their living fishing in the Gulf of Mexico. Like many who do that, they know the economic value of a healthy ocean. Thank you. Yeah. How long have you had this boat? Well, we've had this boat for 20, 20 years. But this is the boat I go out and make a living on. Red Snapper primarily. Is that right? Yeah, for me. Because I'm older and I want the easiest fish I can catch. <laughs> Welcome to After the Fact from the Pew Charitable Trusts. I'm Dan LaDuke. Florida's population is growing, and tourists, of course, have always loved it. One big reason is the water. The state is surrounded on three sides by it. The value of the water here and around the world is gaining a new name, the blue economy. Tom Dillon, who oversees Pew's international environment programs, explained more in a conversation we had after our visit to Florida. Um, the data point for this episode is $2.5 trillion, and let's make the point that it's $2.5 trillion. That's a lot of money. And that's the value of the economic benefits uh, that the ocean generates each year in the world. So how do you or even arrive at that number? How do you, how do you figure that out? And that, that number is astoundingly large. Isn't it, it is. It's huge. Yeah. yeah. And it is, it's, it would be, if it were its own national economy, it would be the seventh largest in the world. Wow. I mean, that, and that doesn't even include all the benefits from the ocean. Those are just the direct economic benefits. And so, tick off some of that stuff so we know what we're talking about here. The one that you would think of first, of course, fisheries. Right. Fisheries are worth about $300 billion a year. So, that's only a little more than 10% of it. Right. The rest comes from tourism, which is the fastest growing economic sector in the world, is a large proportion of this. It also includes the benefit of shipping. Um, those are the three biggest areas, okay. tourism, shipping, and fisheries. There are lots of other economic benefits that come from the ocean, too. If we were to try and quantify and monetize some of the other benefits, I think the, the number would be astounding. It would be by far the largest in, in the world. If we were able, for instance, to quantify what it means that half the oxygen we breathe comes from the ocean. Right, and that's a good point that people may not realize, right? We think of trees and helping us with carbon dioxide, but it's the ocean that plays the biggest role globally. That's right. The ocean um, drives much of the weather patterns on the planet, much of the precipitation. It also holds in the heat from the planet and the carbon dioxide. And so something like 80% of the world's carbon gets sequestered or uh, into, into the ocean. Right. Otherwise, it would be out there causing more pollution. We are more connected to the ocean than we know. The ocean provides every other breath we take by producing oxygen. And of course, it produces massive amounts of food. So our food security, our own health depends on the ocean. One billion people are dependent upon the protein from fish from the ocean. So that's a large percentage of the world's primary protein needs actually come, come from the oceans. But we don't usually think of the economic value. So right. we think of this existence value. Mm -hmm. But the economic value is, is astounding. And it's really important to realize it so that we know that our economies actually are dependent. The health of our economies are dependent on the health of the ocean. So this is called the blue economy now, right? I mean, this is a new phrase that people who do what you do are starting to employ. Why is it important to talk about it that way now? Yeah, the, the term, the sustainable blue economy, has, has only existed for about six years. Mm. And the importance of talking about it and framing the ocean in these terms is to show people that the value is not only phenomenally large, but that if we don't maintain that value, it will erode, and it erodes our lives and, and our own economies. And that hasn't really been the paradigm. Now, that hasn't been what we've thought. That hasn't been what either decision makers or the public have given attention to until very recently. 
So the focus has been on uh, some of these other indicators that we've been tracking for a while that are just sort of a little tro- more than a little troubling by themselves. Well, amazingly, you know, fisheries are in more trouble than people even know. Ninety percent of the world's fisheries are are overfished already, and so that means virtually all of them. That means, yeah, the one of the countries that has done the best to uh, take control over fisheries and make them more sustainable is the United States. Actually, we have now one of the most responsible and sustainable fisheries in the world. It can still improve, but the situation globally is pretty bad. A lot of that is driven by illegal fishing. Mm. One of the most unfortunate statistics is that under current trends, there will be as much plastic in the ocean by weight as fish. Can you imagine that? And that's because of both all the waste going into the ocean, much of it plastic, and because of all the massive overfishing that is being driven by um, propped up economies. So we're adding to one, subtracting from the other, and the net effect is we could have as much plastic in in the ocean as we do fish. Yeah. Considering that the ocean is two-thirds of the planet, it is so vast, can you imagine that we could have that much impact? I don't think most of us are aware that humans can have that level of impact on our planet. Well, what are the other signs that the ocean are in trouble beyond fisheries? So one of one of the big issues is rising seas. And what and that has a direct impact on human communities. Um, we are seeing frequent, more frequent storms, and the intensity of storms is growing. And when you combine that with that sea level is rising, we, there is a major impact on coastal cities and on coastal communities. Protecting natural habitats along the coast is the best way you can, you can prevent this impact and that and so it's it is things like coral reefs and that the uh, healthy coral reefs make uh, can break the impact of of waves right but as they as they die they they actually subside and there's and, nothing to stop so those there's waves nothing to stop the waves yeah mangroves which exist in the tropics and in places like florida are a great natural barrier to protect coastal communities from rising sea levels and more frequent storms. What we need to do is restore more of this coastal habitat and protect what we have. Just imagine the benefit this this is for insurance and that insurance payouts can be smaller if there's more natural production, natural infrastructure, rather than trying to put in hard hard infrastructure like seawalls, which ultimately break down and don't work anyway. So w- with all this to be done, and with all of the sort of concerns about the state of things as they've been going, are you able to be optimistic? I think we all have to be optimistic. Our, our very existence uh, depends on it. And I think they're good signs for, of optimism as well, in that while only 4% of the ocean is under conservation protection, that it is growing very quickly. And the, the uh, trajectory is steep, and there is increasing uh, understanding and support around the world for efforts like that. Just in the past year, we've seen some of the largest marine protected areas in the world created. On plastics, it is now, the word is out. We are seeing action on plastics all over the place, from companies deciding to change their products to uh, schools deciding not to use straws any longer. I mean, ranging from smaller efforts to really big efforts, looking at new ways to recycle new types of chemicals to be that can be used in plastics, big efforts to increase waste management in the developing world. So we are seeing action, but it needs to accelerate beyond where it is. From their quiet home in Steenhatchee, Florida, Jim and Patty Zubrick have seen plenty of action during their four decades on Florida's Gulf Coast. They know more needs to be done to bolster the blue economy, which, after all, is their economy. 
As part of the fishing industry, they contribute to this state's $30 billion marine economy, which, according to the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, ranks second in the country and contributes 3.4 percent of the nation's GDP. We sat down with them on a dock overlooking their fishing boat, the Jolly Roger Two. The Inhatchee River, we call it paradise. Well, we, we sum it up this way, that we, uh, our nearest traffic light is almost 30 miles away. Except for a blinking light, we don't call that traffic. That doesn't count. <laughs> and our nearest Walmart is either Chieflin or Perry. That's 45 miles. And our nearest Home Depot is over 80 miles. So we are very remote. And uh, this is the, one of the largest counties in the state with the least amount of population. So we're blessed here, 62 miles of coastline. And we are, there's only two towns like this on it for 62 miles. You're describing the blue economy as central to where you live. It is. If you're a Floridian and you, you're a recreational fisherman, which I was all through my childhood, it just seemed like a normal uh, to gravitate towards uh, something I could make some money at doing it. So I got into charter business. That was the first thing that was the easiest thing to get into. And uh, the commercial fishing. Commercial fishing is when uh, a limited number of guys are out to, to make money off the fish they catch because on a charter you can't sell your catch but on a commercial fishing trip, licensed commercial trip, you can sell your fish. And I would guess in the terms of the scheme of things that's the commercial part of a big business. I mean that's where fishing, you can make a, a true good living. Absolutely. Yeah. So in the Gulf of Mexico 40 years ago there was lots of fish. There were many more fish. The, the stories that people talk about, about so many that you could take a snatch hook and just throw it out and snatch fish is absolutely correct. I saw it. Today, because our fish stocks have been depleted, we've settled on a lower amount of sustainability. We're sustainable with so many of our stocks, but they're still not of the, the tax of 100 years ago. I guess you really don't even stop to think about it because it's so plentiful at the time. But then, you know, as the years go on, you see different uh, stocks not so popular or not so um, available. And then things started dwindling. Red Snapper, of course, um, which is the poster child of the Gulf, the IFQ system coming back. Um, it's, it's just it's a remarkable story there. But that was one of the very first fish that it was almost extinct, wouldn't you say, Jim? Yeah, yeah. They, uh, that's what we, uh, well, it was the most plentiful at one time. 90% of every fish sold in the Gulf of Mexico was a red snapper. When did you start to see the depletion? I would say that it, it really reared its ugly head in the early 90s. That's when awareness, you know, the Fed started getting involved because prior to 1989, there wasn't even a federal permit required for fishing. But my catches were down. My charter, my charter, it was tougher to go out and get customers their fish. Well, then you see the decline of the species. You become actively involved in the uh, rulemaking process. Um, you know, education is a wonderful thing. It, 98 was the, uh, finally the time where I said, well, there's not going to be any of this. I can't, I'm not going to be able to make a living. Uh, or our other people. You were ready to, you thought it was over. Yeah, I mean, everybody did. And uh, that's what made, worked us towards a catch share, a quota system. The individual fishing quota, which is yeah, a catch share program, we all have our own <clears throat> individual quota. So I could go catch it all in the first six months of the year last six months of the year, or I can blend it over 12 months. That's what we do. Nothing's worse than a farmer, and that's what we are basically, as farmers, uh, bringing back all, everybody bringing their corn in at one time. So that's why you try to stagger crop, you know, crops and things and different states uh, mature their crops differently, just like us. Everybody goes out and comes back. That's why we went to the IFQ. IFQ stands for Individual Fishing Quota, a kind of catch-share system that regulates how many fish are taken from the water. Since the IFQ system uh, in 2010 for grouper, we're enjoying 
300% increase in prices. I write down to every fish that comes on that boat that goes in that box. I had 690 red snapper on my last trip, 690 individual fish and not one throwback because our size limit is 13 inches and I get paid the same for that 13 inch fish, that 13 inch red Purple, snapper yep. as I do a 23 inch fish. So there's no incentive to throw one back because he's too small, but we're in a hundred and some feet of water, 200 feet, 250 sometimes, he's not gonna make it. So when you throw him back, you know that. And that's what, you gotta have something inside of you that says that's just wrong. Gulf red snapper are a popular fish in Florida and a mainstay of restaurant menus across the state. With fishing quotas like those Jim mentioned, their numbers are recovering. Jim and Patty have seen up close the value of these catch limits and have encouraged lawmakers and others in the industry to look to science to guide fisheries management. Keep in mind, 1998, and we just go back there, forget about even earlier, I was an, an obvious minority in folks like me that were attending the meetings coming out of the recreational ranks. Conservation wasn't part of it in those 90s. It really wasn't. There was some movement, you know, what we needed to do, but uh, it wasn't until we saw things get ugly in early 2000s. We had a lot of those storms. Mm -hmm. We had uh, pollution. We had ex a lot of red tides. Uh, all those little, those little things maybe pushed a lot more folks towards uh, a sta sustainability and especially accountability. If we don't know what we're taking, they, they put a target on how many fish, an annual target or a catch rate or catch limit, well, we ought to accurately know whether we hit it or not. And the, uh, the folks who are doing the monitoring, it's not precise. It is precise for the commercial sector now because we're so highly regulated with tracking, satellite tracking and reporting and enforcement. But the recreational guy who actually catches 65 to 70 percent of all the fish in the Gulf Though the lion's share of the gag grouper, the lion's share of the amberjack, triggerfish, uh, all the trout, all the redfish, the snook, the majority of the sheephead, all those fish just start seeing the end. Uh, wasn't comfortable. I want to leave it better than I had it. What does sustainable fishing mean to you guys as commercial fishermen? It means taking care of a resource so it continues to populate and grow itself. If it were not sustainable, we wouldn't have that fish to catch in the future. Um, and it's, you know, we, we wouldn't be able to be commercial fishermen because we couldn't support ourselves financially. Sustainability is kind of an, an abstract word. It, it's just, it's an, um, an amount of fish that's set, but it's not as much as it used to be and hopefully it'll be more in the future, but it's an amount where you can take a, a qualified catch. You, got, uh, you can take 100 fish, but you gotta count those 100 fish. That's the only way sustainability works is by counting accurately what you're taking. And that's the science, the science of counting the fish, setting those catch limits to where we can still have a sustainable yield fish. You clearly love this life. When you talk about other people needing it, wanting it for them, what is it about this life that is so appealing? You know, it's wonderful to be out there and it's all about mother nature. I mean, this is a God-given resource. And when you're out there on the water, you're so dependent on nature. Those storms pick up, depends what you catch, the moon. I mean, you have no phone service. It's just, it's a wonderful thing to do. When you're out there on the water, even if it's with five guys on a charter trip, you have this camaraderie. You get a chance to spend some time you're talking and the experience of delivering something that the average guy is never going to uh, ever going to experience. If the new regulations hadn't been put in place over these last couple of decades, if that hadn't happened, would you be here today? I could still be here today but would I be making a living? And would there be anybody new coming in to replace me? Because our resource would have been 
it dwindled down to such a small amount that I don't think that it's it's possible to have kept fishing going. How long you been here? Six and a half years now. How long has this place been here? It was a crab house. It was built in the 60s and stuff changes and it turned into a motel in the 90s. I look around and I see a lot of new construction here. There's a lot of folks that come it, in here. It's, it's, it's picking back up. Yeah. Just off the dock from the Jolly Roger 2 is the Good Times Motel and Marina. Its owner, Martin Pierce, also depends on the blue economy. I'm seeing boats going by. Every one of those boats is a potential customer for you. Absolutely. As scallop season is very busy. This time of year, scallop season is 40% of our bar and grill business and 50% of our motel business in two and a half months. Wow. Yes. You're talking half your business in, in the year happens in two months. Yes, sir. Our community is a fishing village. We do not have beaches. Um, we're we're blue-collar folks going out in either the woods and or in the water. That's what we have. Um, I'm originally from Central Florida, born in Daytona. This is much nicer, <laughs> much better. Yeah, it's very low key here. I like yes, it. Yes, it's much easier. But you know, on my drive here, I passed um, I passed boat repair uh -huh. yards. Mm -hmm. I passed uh, all sorts of businesses that exist to service the folks coming here. Oh yes, yes. If those folks aren't coming here, we don't have anything to do. If, it's, if, we, if we don't have a good season out there, it, it affects us all. Our thanks to Jim and Patty Zubrick for letting us spend a day with them in Florida. They continue to speak for its fish and to steward the fragile recovery of Gulf Coast red snapper. Learn more about the blue economy at our website, pewtrust.org slash after the fact. For the Pew Charitable Trust, I'm Dan LaDuke, and this is After the Fact.